Welcome to Every New Day and this is NTV News and today we'll be talking about Forever Chemicals or PFAS's. What are they and where do you find them? What if a chemical you never heard of was inside your clothes, your cookware and even your food and it never goes away? Today we dig into the hidden world of Forever Chemicals. How they got here, what harm they may cause, and what you can do about it. This investigative report draws on recent exposés, peer-reviewed science, and global case studies. Let's begin. PFAS, short for per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, is a large class, thousands of synthetic chemicals designed to repel water, oil, stains, and heat. My floral alkyl substances, it's a mouthful. So we tend to call them forever chemicals. They're permanent, they live forever, they don't break down. They're not naturally found. These are synthetic chemicals that are completely man-made. They're altering us at a cellular level. They're endocrine disrupting, hormone disrupting. PFOS is a class of chemicals that were used originally as 3M Scotchgard and then uh, 3M sold it to DuPont who created Teflon from it. PFOS is the 9,000 variants of those two chemicals that they have created that get around the ban. Because of their strong carbon fluorine bonds, many PFAS are extremely persistent. They resist degradation in the environment and can accumulate in living systems. PFAS are often called forever chemicals for good reason. Once released, they can linger for years or even decades. Some familiar uses, such as found in non-stick cookware or Teflon coatings, stain or water-resistant fabrics, grease-resistant food packaging, firefighting foams, and even more. Because they are used in so many products and industrial settings, PFAS gradually leak into the air, land, water, soil, and food chain. Now that we know what they are, let's see where they show up, often where we least expect them. One of the first revelations, PFAS are found in everyday consumer products, many of which don't disclose their presence. Hmm. For example, Consumer Reports found PFAS in many food packaging materials, even in cases where they shouldn't be present. In a global study, scientists discovered 61 PFAS compounds in food packaging around the world, many of them not even allowed in food packaging by regulatory lists. That means PFAS can migrate or bleed from packaging into the food itself. That's pretty scary. PFAS also contaminate land and water near industrial sites. Because they don't break down easily, they travel through soil and groundwater, spreading contamination far beyond the original source. Currently, we have reached planetary saturation levels for PFAS, which means that when you look up at that cloud and it rains, it rains unsafe levels of at least four PFAS species. It turns out that our entire water cycle is contaminated with PFAS. So even when it rains on the Tibetan plateau, that rain contains PFAS. To check the water levels in your area, you can use these maps that show PFAS contamination across the US, Europe, and Australia. In one dramatic case, firefighting foam, or AFFF, used at military bases or airports has been a major PFAS source to water systems. We'll revisit this case shortly. The US Government Accountability Office even calls PFAS perhaps the biggest water problem since lead. But perhaps the most insidious pathway is through what we eat and drink. Recent studies increasingly point to food and drinking water as major exposure routes for PFAS. 
One 2025 study of California adults found that while exposure to older PFAS types have declined in many foods over decades, seafood, eggs, and brown rice still contribute measurably to PFAS burden. Another longitudinal study examined how diet patterns relate to rising PFAS levels over time. The authors found that higher consumption of tea, processed meats, and food prepared outside the home, i.e. in packaging, for instance, was correlated with higher PFAS blood levels. Interestingly, eating more home prepared food was associated with lower PFAS levels in some cases. Meanwhile, an advocacy and research group in Europe recently analyzed nearly 3,000 food samples across Germany, France, Denmark, and Netherlands, finding that many staple foods, such as fish, offal, eggs, dairy, cereals, were contaminated by regulated PFAS. In many jurisdictions, only a few PFAS compounds are regulated in food, even though thousands exist. And many food categories currently have no legal PFAS limits. Of course, the big question, why do we care? <laughs> what are the risks to human health and ecosystems? PFAS exposure is associated with a wide array of health concerns. Though the science is still evolving, the evidence is compelling. Some of the known or suspected effects include increased risk of kidney and testicular cancer seen in epidemiological cohorts, hormonal disruption, including thyroid disease and fertility effects, liver damage, elevated cholesterol, immune suppression, weakened vaccine responses, for instance, etc. Impacts on fetal development, birth outcomes, and pediatric effects. Because PFAS persist in the environment, they can bioaccumulate in wildlife and travel up the food chain, magnifying ecological harm. In many places, PFAS contamination disproportionately impacts communities near industrial sites or lower income areas with less political clout, creating environmental justice concerns. The difficulty for many newer PFAS compounds, we lack long-term human data. That plus regulatory delays and corporate lobbying means many exposures are effectively unmonitored or unregulated. To understand just how deep the contamination runs, let's bring in real investigative storytelling. Let's start with a video which we've researched and watched. You'll find a link down below in our sources. How one company secretly poisoned the planet. This is a video you can find on YouTube by Veritasium. This is one of the most compelling pieces of investigative storytelling on this subject. One of Monsanto's main herbicide factories was in Nitro, West Virginia, where they pumped out almost a ton of 245T a day. By 1949, Monsanto's business was booming, when all of a sudden, the plant exploded. Over a hundred workers rushed out to see a dark cloud rising 40 meters above the factory. They watched as a black stinking powder started raining down on their faces. Within hours, many of these men fell ill. First, they got headaches and nausea, but then their skin began to erupt with bumps, pustules, and acne. The lesions on some of the workers' faces got so bad that Monsanto's on-site doctors had to peel off layers of their skin in an attempt to remove them. The doctors later noted that when these men are in a closed room together, there is a strong odor. They wrote, We believe these men are excreting a foreign chemical through their skins. But neither the doctors nor anyone else at Monsanto knew what the chemical was because both 245T and 24D were marketed as very safe. And in that video, Derek Mueller traces how a chemical company's leaks and lax regulation have allowed PFAS contamination to spread globally. 
affecting water, soil, human health, and ecosystems. The video sparked public interest the same day the US EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, announced rollbacks of some PFAS safeguards, a dynamic illustration of how science, policy, and public awareness intersect. Another dramatic real-world case, in Ronneby, Sweden, a municipality's drinking water was contaminated by PFAS from an airbase using firefighting foams. Residents were unknowingly drinking forever chemicals for years. The case went to Sweden's Supreme Court in 2023. The court ruled that just the presence of PFAS in blood can constitute personal injury, a precedent with global implications. Meanwhile, in the US, Maryland recently sued W.L. Gore and Associates, the maker of Gore-Tex, over alleged PFAS pollution of air and water. These lawsuits show that contamination reaches far beyond laboratories into governance, corporate accountability, and legal systems. So with contamination clear, what are governments, regulators, and scientists doing? And what are the obstacles? Regulation of PFAS is a patchwork globally. Some chemicals and some uses are banned, but many remain legal or poorly regulated. In the US, the EPA has recently moved to set limits on six PFAS in drinking water, requiring monitoring in public water systems by 2027. But enforcement is difficult. The resources are limited and many PFAS variants remain unregulated. In Europe, advocacy groups have pushed for stronger bans. In 2025, France passed one of the more ambitious PFAS laws, banning manufacture import or sale in cosmetics, textiles, with some exceptions, and ski waxes. What? with a plan to phase out PFAS in all textiles by 2030. But even that law exempts cookware, a notable compromise. On the remediation side, one promising technology is thermal destruction, using high heat to break the carbon fluorine bonds. For example, the US EPA is testing a two-story furnace for PFAS destruction. But challenges abound if incomplete. Combustion may produce toxic byproducts. Costs are high. Identifying all PFAS in waste streams is difficult. And even after treatment, residual contamination may remain. I really worry that so many people are having this, being exposed to this, drinking this, and they have no way of knowing. You can't taste it, you can't smell it, you can't see it. Our chemical and regulatory system has failed us. In the scientific domain, better sensors are being developed. For example, ultra-sensitive detection of PFOA, which stands for perfluorooctanoic acid. It is one of many of man-made chemicals known associated, such as PFASs. Also, new modeling, such as geospatial deep learning, helps predict PFAS spread in waterways to guide cleanup prioritization. Even so, many argue that regulating PFAS as a class rather than piecemeal by individual compounds is necessary to avoid regrettable substitutions. For instance, swapping one harmful PFAS for another. Still, politics, industry resistance, scientific uncertainty, and cleanup costs make progress slow. To close the loop, here's what you, as a viewer, a consumer, and a citizen, can do personally and collectively. While systemic change is essential, individuals can also reduce personal PFAS exposures. And here are some practical steps. One, avoid non-stick cookware with suspect coatings. Use stainless steel, cast iron, ceramic, or glass alternatives. Two, limit use of packaged grease-resistant wrappers like takeout boxes, microwave popcorn bags, 
These often use PFAS. 3. Filter drinking water, if possible. Technologies like reverse osmosis or granular activated carbon can reduce PFAS levels, with some caveats. 4. Eat more whole, minimally packaged foods and cook at home to minimize exposure via packaging. Well, this is going to be especially trickier in this day and age, given how door dashing or ordering food delivery has become so much more the trend than mainstream. But still, it's something to consider. Five, advocacy and civic engagement. Demand transparency, stricter PFAS regulation, and clean up in your local area. And finally, six, stay informed and support scientific and legal action. Science is moving, but public pressure matters. In summary, PFAS contamination is not a future threat. It's here, embedded in our products, food, water, and bodies. Through investigative journalism, science, and collective pressure, we can push for accountability, remediation, and safer chemical policy. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like, subscribe for more, and share. Inform your loved ones, your friends, and those around you about PFAS and how important it is to be much more aware of what you're wearing, what you're putting into your body, because we get lost in the moment of the day to day. And uh, sometimes convenience is not the answer. Sometimes it takes time to really take a moment to really reflect on what it is that we are doing to our bodies and what we're putting into our bodies. Check our sources below. There will be the two links to very specific videos that relate to this, which are very enlightening and some other interesting links. Thank you and stay safe and stay curious. This was NTV. Thank you.